Hello, everyone. Today, we are going to talk about the topic of um, data leakage. This is a problem that can happen when you are analyzing any signal and in an attempt to do like pattern recognition on it, and you are actually using a overlapping set of windows with cross validation. So let's dive in and explain more about how can this problem happen and how to avoid it. So specifically what I'm looking at here, um, and as an example, is the EMG pattern recognition system. So with the EMG rec uh, pattern recognition system, I have a valuable source of information, which is the EMG signal from the human muscles. But the problem is that um, the information that are available in the EMG signal is often represented in a useless form. Why is that? Because the EMG signal is random or stochastic in its nature, which means that the information is dispersed across the dimensions. So to implement some sort of pattern recognition framework on the EMG signal, you have to analyze um, small portions of these signals. Why small portions? Because you have to worry about the delay, like how fast can you make a decision? So typically what we do usually with the EMG pattern recognition system is that when we try or when we attempt to construct a continuous gesture recognition system based on the EMG, we typically use a windowing scheme to look at small segments of the EMG signal and then extract features from these segments and submit them to the classifier. So to analyze the um, EMG signals, we typically use um, two kinds of uh, windowing techniques. These are the overlapping windows, as the name imply, uh, that is the case when the former window overlaps with the current window. And you can also use the non-overlapping or the disjoint windows um, scheme, where the windows are actually um, separate from each other or independent from, it's not independent, but let's say separate from each other. And um, the increment in this case is equal to the window analysis length itself. So visually, let me show you these two examples. On the left side, you see the disjoint window scheme. So in this case, you have a signal, one dimensional signal, any kind of signal, but I'm going to talk about the EMG today. So you analyze a window of the EMG. Um, in the old days, we used to set the window size, analysis window size to 256 millisecond, because we used to, or we wanted to keep the whole delay below 300 millisecond for some reasons, known for those who work on EMG pattern recognition systems. So in the disjoint window, you will collect one analysis window width of 256 millisecond. And then um, the, you submit this for processing. So if you see the time here tau, that's time taken for feature extraction and classification. So you will only produce a decision after tau um, amount of time. So the next decision will only be given after you have actually waited for another complete 256 millisecond, and then you process that and generate the next decision, and so on for the remaining decisions. On the right, you can see an example of the overlapping window scheme. The good thing here is that as soon as you have one window, you can process that and extract features and implement classification to get a decision. But meanwhile, you are, you are also collecting data. So you don't have to wait as it was in the, like the case here. You don't have to wait for a completely new window, but you just have to wait for a tiny amount of time to accumulate more data. Because in this case, you are going to process a new window, which is a shifted version of the original one. And then again, tau amount of time to process that and generate a decision and so on. You keep moving to the right side. In this case, the number of windows that you are going to analyze is usually given by this equation. And that is the data size. So the size of the whole data set that you have over here minus the window size divided by the window increment. And that's this amount. By how much do you push the window to the right? plus one. You can read up more about these two versions and their use and like which one is more suitable for real-time analysis in this paper, which is um, considered as a golden reference in this um, field for EMG pattern recognition. So you can refer to the paper over there. Now let's talk about some parameters. So now I said I'll be analyzing 
um, the EMG signal uses uh, using some sort of um, windowing technique. So let me focus on the overlapping windows technique because that's where the focus of today's video is all about. So I analyze this amount of data um, and that's what I mean by I'm taking a window. So I'm taking a window of the original EMG signal and processing it. The next time, um, the thing, what happens over there is that I don't have to wait for a completely uh, new window to accumulate and to be over here. So the next time that I'm going to analyze a window, what I'm doing actually, I'm going to push this analysis window to the right. As you can see, we are pushing that to the right by an amount that is called the window increment. So the window increment is by how much do you push the analysis window to the right. The window size is the whole width of the window and the overlap is the joint portion between the new window and the old window. So in this case, the joint portion will be what if I can draw over here. So the joint portion will be somewhere starting from here up until here. That will be the joint portion. Okay. Now going back to, um, let's say our problem. So I will keep moving the window to the right or shifting the window to the right and then extracting features. So I keep pushing. Again, I push by a window increment that does not change. So the window increment is fixed and the window size is fixed. Now, there are a few things to keep in mind with this kind of uh, processing technique. First thing is that the smaller the increment, and that is um, the less amount that you push to the right, the more overlapping between the current and the previous window. So if I am standing here and I push only a tiny bit, in that case, my window increment will be very tiny and the overlap between the new window and the original window is very big. So I will be looking at almost the same EMG signal or portion of the EMG signal. The next thing to keep in mind is that the smaller the increment, because um, let's say if you, like you are pushing slowly or if you want to push slowly, that means you will have more windows. So the smaller the increment, the more windows. How is that possible? Just imagine that you have a box and you are pushing it from one wall to the other. The smaller the amount of pushes that you do over there, and then like you have more samples, basically, you more you have more time to go from the first point to the end point. So from here to there. Now, the window increment affects the rate at which the class decisions will be made. And consequently, it determines the real time um, constraint of the system. But be careful how you chop your data for training and testing when you have a higher degree of overlapping. So we often talk about these parameters. So we'll see most of the papers. They either talk about the window size and the window increment or the window size and the window overlap. So either two of the sets or of the parameters, sorry. So let's talk about the different validation approaches that you can have over here. So in validation approach one, I show you one example where we have four channels of EMG signals displayed over here. And as you can see, um, this is the, um, let, let's say the training data and this is the testing data. So in this example, what the authors have been doing is that um, they collect, let's say over here, a 30 seconds worth of data from four channels across six classes. So each class or each movement class will have five seconds worth of data. And in the testing set, they repeat that process again. So you have a training data and a testing data. Each one of them have trials and each trial is made of five seconds. Typically, what we do usually, or what you can do in the first approach of validation, is that you just chop the available data into two portions, a training and a testing set. So training set, 
a testing set. And as you can see in this case, they are completely separate from each other if you chop them from here. So an approach where the training and testing data segments are separated from each other has frequently been implemented in the literature. So another case where you can usually implement this approach is, for example, what happened with the Nina Pro databases. So with the Nina Pro databases, each movement class is actually repeated across a number of trials. For example, five, you will see the subject is actually performing each movement at least five or six times. In that case, if you want to use a similar validation approach like this, what you can easily do, for example, chop the data from here, take the trial one, two, three for training or for generating the training data. So you will use your sliding window approach over here and you keep pushing from the first to this point, from the first point to this point and keep going to the right and extracting features. And for the testing set, allocate the trial number four and number five. So in this case, you have no problem. You can do proper validation over here, which is one way of doing validation. I'm not saying it's the best. It's just one way of doing validation. Now, the second way of validating, or let's say second approach of validation for the same data set, what you can do over here is that you can do a leave one trial out. Uh, personally, I like prefer the leave one trial out. So what we do here usually, I'll say I have the first trial of every single movement over here. I'll use that to generate the training feature set and the testing feature set will come from the next part. Then what you can do is that you use the second feature set or the second trial, sorry, for generating the training feature set and the first trial for generating the testing feature set. And then you average. So basically what we are trying to say over here, if you have a number of trials available for you, I personally would say just implement a leave one trial out testing scheme. So let me explain that again. If I have each of the movement, so each of these classes of movements, one, two, three, four, five, six, imagine that each one of them, instead of being repeated just one or two times, imagine that each movement is repeated across a number of five trials. So I have five trials of pronation, five trials of supination, five trials of hand close, hand open, and so on. What I usually prefer to do is leave one trial out. So what, what I mean by that is that you will start from here, take the first trial, take um, extract the, um, let's say, testing features from here, and the remaining trials, two, three, four, five, allocate them for extracting the training features. Then use the second trial for extracting the testing feature set and the trial number one, three, four, and five for generating the other feature set, which is the training feature set. Then you move forward to the third one. I'll extract the testing features from the third and the training features from the first, second, fourth, and fifth, and so on until you reach the end. Eventually, you just average all the results together. And that's what I personally attempt to do when I use these kind of data sets with several trials in each movement. So now you have two ways of validation. You can either use the leave one trial out and then you average, or you can just, um, let's say, chop the data and say these number of trials for training and these for testing. And in this case, you have, let's say, separate training and testing data. So you won't have issues. Now pay attention to the third approach, which I'm going to show you right now. Same data set. I'm not going to chop the data into two parts and I'm not going to do leave one trial out. I'm going to show you another approach, which um, some of the uh, researchers are doing nowadays. So instead of using the previous two approaches, just bring the analysis windows, the overlapping windows, put the first one over here, slide your windows to the right and keep extracting features. And then what happens is that just, um, let's say, after you extracted all the features, implement cross-validation. What do you think? Is that reasonable? 
Now, when applying the latest development of CNN or LSTM or any other recent deep learning model, we know that more data is usually needed for training. So what some PhD candidates are doing or some early career researchers are also doing is that they attempt to use some sort of analysis window, slow down the increments, make the increment very tiny, so you can generate a huge number of windows by doing the analysis window scheme from the left to the right. You extract a large number of windows, and then they use cross-validation just because they saw that applied with image recognition with CNN or LSTM or any other model. Now, um, basically, the approach over here that's being used is called a sample-based cross-validation. However, you need to know that with sample-based cross-validation, we usually, or before starting the process, you have to randomize the order of the extracted features or the order of the windows. And if you randomize the order of the windows and then you use some of them for training and some of them for testing, you could have a potential data leakage. Let me explain. This is k-fold cross-validation. All right, so with k-fold cross-validation, um, you chop the data. So basically, let's just get the example. Imagine you have a number of samples, which is uh, 12 samples, and you want to implement three-fold cross-validation. So what you do in this case, randomize the samples, and then you take um, or chop the data into three equivalent portions. Every time, the blue goes for test, and the remaining two portions, the red, go for training. You do that three times, and then you average the results. However, do you think this is a reasonable choice to do when you are actually using an overlapping Windows scheme? Now, with the overlapping Windows scheme, again, pay attention to what's going on over here. It's that the first window and the second window and the remaining window, they are very highly overlapped. So the first and the second highly overlap, second and the third highly overlap, which could be the first and the third as well, depending on the parameters that you have chosen with a good potential of overlap. So now in one, um, let's say scenario, let's say I have nine windows and I'm extracted the windows and extracted features from each of the windows. And then I'm trying to attempt to do cross-validation. Okay, sample-based cross-validation. The first step will be to randomize the order. Okay, I randomize the order of the samples. Then I started doing um, validation. So every time I use three samples for training, the remaining for testing. In this case, the testing samples are one, eight, and three. So samples that came from the first window, the eighth window, and the third window are used for testing. And the samples that came from the remaining windows, like four, five, seven, nine, two, six, they are all allocated for um, the training. What is the problem over here? The problem is that if you put the first window for testing and the second window for training, the first and the second, they are already highly overlapped. They are covering, if, if you use like small increments, these two windows are covering almost the same portion of the EMG signal. And the same happened, for example, with window eight and window nine. If you use small increments to generate more windows or more samples for your CNN or LSTM or whatever model that you're using, these are actually highly overlapped. So because you have randomized and chopped the data into training and testing, there is a like a good chance that one of them will be allocated to the training, one of them for the testing. In this case, you are actually leaking the data from the training set to the testing set or vice versa because your windows were highly overlapped. Now, I'm not saying do not use cross-validation. I'm saying pay attention when you use cross-validation or specifically sample-based cross-validation with an overlap, overlapping window scheme for the EMG signal analysis or any other signal. So a recent trend in EMG pattern recognition suggests that more overlap means less error. Well, I can't say right or wrong, 
it, like in the case yeah, like you are doing these kinds of this type of analysis, well, it does. And that's not a finding, or let's say that's not something that's going to always reduce the error. It's a consequence of the way that you have analyzed your data and chopped them in the training and testing because you have like, let's say, um, kind of um, implemented this scheme unintentionally created a scenario where the data leaked from training to testing. So if you have separated the trials for training and testing from the beginning, this wouldn't have happened. And this finding might not hold. So again, data leakage is a problem that happens when the data used to generate the training feature set is leaked into the training feature set. So small increments means that the two windows or number of windows will be capturing almost the same EMG record or same data record. So sample-based cross-validation might easily assign one or let's say some of these samples into the training set and the next uh, one or next set of samples to the testing set because of the internal randomization of samples when you implement sample-based cross-validation. So further reducing the increments, if you slow down your increments, it means you will generate more samples and if you implement randomization, it means you will have more chances of allocating, um, let's say, a, like one window to the training set and the very next window to the testing set. So you have created a leakage unintentionally. So the claim in the recent literature that more overlapping means less error in my electric control or EMG pattern recognition is a consequence of the data leakage that you have unintentionally create. So if I use a, let's say, leave one trial out uh, validation technique, this claim that more overlapping means less error may not hold. So you have to try it and then prove it to us and do some sort of statistical analysis to validate this claim. But if you use an overlapping window scheme and then you implement sample-based cross-validation with randomization, please do not make this claim because it's a consequence of the data leakage. So the conclusion, avoid using sample cross-validation in EMG pattern recognition. Typically, each of the data sets available online or even the one that you are going to collect yourself, you usually or typically you collect few trials of every single movement. Just allocate some of these trials for training or, and some of them for testing or implement a leave one trial out. Potentially, you can also implement a session, complete session. So let's say run one session where you collect free trials of this movement and then another session for uh, collecting a new set of trials and then do your testing. So you tr use trial-based validation technique or session-based validation techniques to avoid falling into the data leakage problem. That is all for today. Thank you very much.